and mechanization of production. So that is where all this has started. So what before produce threads on simple spinning wheels, the mechanized version achieved eight times the volume at the same time. So using different powers like steam power, this could be achieved that instead of having what the volume was say x, it started producing 8x of that volume. Okay, so the use of it, this industrial purposes was the greatest breakthrough for increasing human production. So instead of weaving looms powered by muscles, steam engines replace them. So developments such as steam ship. So just after that, uh, the steam ships came on and or the steam powered locomotives like the, even the steam powered rail engines came after that. So this is how the industry 1.0, the coinage of course, this industry 1.0 coinage came up much later. But you can see that the first India industrial revolution is nothing but this industry 1.0. Now moving on to the industry 2.0, the second industrial revolution. So it started uh, by the idea of Henry Ford, the uh, founder of Ford Motors, who took the idea of mass production from a slaughterhouse in Chicago. The pigs hung for conveyor belts and each butcher performed only a part of the task of butchering the animals. Henry Ford carried this idea into automobile production. So while before one station assembled a whole automobile, the full car or the full say bus, it instead had different kinds of section to assemble one type of the part of the car. So this is how uh, the second industrial revolution began. So if what was its major role, so its major role was to build something significantly faster and at a lower cost. So this invention of conveyor belts and invention of <coughs> assembly lines helped in doing it faster, doing it at a lower cost. So this is industry 2.0, it is middle of say uh, 19th century. Now moving on to the industry 3.0. This is the 20th century, the 1970s. Uh, it started with the partial automation using memory programmable controls and computers. So computers started to come in, coming in, in the process of production, process of automation. Without human assistance, uh, this kind of technologies came up, so all these robots came up, so that is why you see all these ideas came uh, much before that. So if you could see the 1960s films, movies of James Bond or any other, those kind of movies. All those are showing some kind of this kind of inventions. And the different robot, robotic movies where you have seen some robots, all this came up in 1960s. We talked about our robotic robots performing programmed sequence. You have some different <coughs> activities one after the other, and the industry took the help of robot to do this program sequence. So this is the industry 3.0, which happened in the 1970s. See the progress now. So. The first revolution of industry 1.0 was in 18th century. The second one was in middle of 19th century. So almost say a gap of 80, 90 years. But see the gap now. Industry 3.0 happening in 1970s, but industry 4.0 has come round about after the 2000s. So it is around say 2010 onwards, this coinage came up of industry 4.0 and now we are here in industry 5.0 within a gap of 10 years. So what was 100 years earlier 
now it has become only a gap of 10 years. So it might see our industry 6.0 after 5 to 6 years also. Because that is how rapidly technology is progressing. So in the inaugural session, that was one of the suggestions that we have to cope up with this change. So people were adapting to changes earlier as well. But the progress was much slow. But today's scenario, you will hear one, one after the other concept every three years, every two years. So you have to adapt, at least you should know the fundamentals of it. So one, one of the suggestions in the previous uh, discussion was try to learn the code, definitely. But at the same time, why these MVPs or why these refresher codes are important? Because you have to be kind of at your toes with respect to knowing the new technologies, new concept, at least you should know the basics. So that not only your teaching purposes as well as your day-to-day -day -day purposes, your interactions, you should not be someone who does not know even the coinage, who does not know even about the term terminologies. So you should be knowing the definitions, should be knowing why, why it is uh, used, why it was invented, those kind of linkages you should try to So industry 4.0. So industry 4.0 has is characterized by the application of information and communication technologies. So it builds on the development of third uh, industrial revolution, production systems that already have computer technology are expanded by a network connections and have a digital twin on the internet, so, so to speak. So I'll talk about the digital twin uh, in detail so uh, in, in subsequent slides. But what is digital twin? Digital twin is basically you have a something physical, but you have to have a design of the digital version of the same physical thing. For example, an elevator. Suppose you are talking about a residential complex having it's a very high network individuals are staying there. So they do not want any breakdown on their business. So you need so you need a physical presence of all the different uh, lift men there? No. If you have a digital version of the lift, how different components of it is, are working. If you know that, and if you can monitor that somewhere else. Sitting on your computer, if you can see that these are the say 25 different components of the lift and they are functioning, everyone is functioning properly. You have a threshold that if some someone so suppose there is flow level, you have to have a proper flow level for each elevator. So if it is say plus minus some millimeters, it's not working fine. So you have a threshold of those plus minus things. And your digital twin is basically that replica of that lift, all these different parameters into your computer. Digitally, you know this, this uh, parameters. And how do you do that? You have sensors attached to the different components of the lift. A sensor which just measures the deviation from the flow. Sensor, sensor which is measuring oil leakage. Sensor just recording what is the speed of the elevator. There can be multiple types of sensors. These are called IoT devices, Internet of Things devices. Again, IoT, I'll touch upon the concept. So, <coughs> digital twin is just like human twins, it's the replica of the original version <coughs> of the physical body. So, this is the major, I would say, uh, breakthrough of industry 4.0 of using this kind of digital twin or sensors. Sensors along with your computing technology. If you combine both of them, you get a digital twin. So uh, there are other things like production automation, networking of all system to cyber physical production system. Therefore, having smart factories. So you previously you used to have only factories. You do not know whether after the breakdown of a certain machinery, you know that the machine has failed. So what used to happen? There was a huge loss 
of that particular factory and ultimately to the GDP of the country because of say 5, 10, 10 day loss of production. Now you know that this machine is going to fail beforehand. So it saves a lot of money not only for the company but also the GDP of the company. So that is why industry 4.0 is very important. Now you have to have this industry 5.0 with the invention of so many technologies in the last 5 years. What industry 5.0 are saying it is dependent on three pillars, human-centric approach, resilience and sustainability. So human-centric approach meaning without humans we cannot have any kind of industrial revolution. People should be at the center of your decision making. So that is why AI, analytics, all these things are interlinked with this. Resilience. Resilience. Resilience is the ability to quickly adapt to change. So again, I will uh, touch upon this uh, topic later on. And uh, sustainability. Sustainability meaning you need to have something for the future. The, you should not produce something which will destroy the world. You need to have a sustainable future. So use of renewable <coughs> energy, use of such things, when, whenever you have the option to use something which is greener, what is greener? Greener meaning which is not having high carbon emissions. Things which like petrol diesel based things, can you shift to uh, some more greener things which is low in energy consumption, low in use, usage of fossil fuels like petrol diesel. So, so that we have a sustainable future for our children and for the other next generations. So these are the three different pillars of the industry 5.0. So now I will talk about the nine pillars of industry 4.0 and the three pillars of the industry 5.0. So what are these nine pillars? Let us first know the names, then I will come back to you. So one is additive manufacturing, which is you can say uh, synonymous to 3D printing. Okay, additive manufacturing. Then second one is augmented reality, AR, and you can also say virtual reality here. So AR here technology, augmented reality. <coughs> Third one is autonomous robots. <coughs> Fourth one is big data and analytics. Fifth one is cloud connectivity. Sixth one is cyber security. I think one of the chairpersons was from uh, one of the university who was talking about this. He's talked about cyber security. So I'll be repeating some of the things. Seven is horizontal and vertical system integration. is IoT, Internet of Things. And 9 is simulations and digital things. So these are the 9 different pillars or concepts of Industry 4.0. <coughs> so what is this Additive manufacturing. So, additive manufacturing is creating <coughs> or recreating 3D objects. So, you have all seen the Xerox machines or the photocopy machines. What it does, it creates 
a copy of your 2D objects, right? 2D objects meaning your say a textbook, a copy. All these are two dimensions. Cannot feel it uh, like a 3D object. So this particular concept came in early uh, 2000, where he is talking about creating 3D objects. So what it will help? It will help in additive manufacturing. Meaning, if you have created one particular product, you can create hundreds, thousands of <coughs> prototypes just by copy. So it saves a lot of time of especially the manufacturing industry. Not only time, a huge cost. Because you can have like a uh, photocopier, like a Xerox machine, it creates 3D objects within no time, within very limited time. So the difference with any other manufacturing process, you have a huge system which takes around say sometimes in hours, sometimes in days to produce different products because it takes such a time. But if you are use a 3D printer, it will do it almost automatically, almost without no time. So additive manufacturing uses computer aided design software or 3D object scanner to direct hardware to deposit material layer upon layer in precise geometric shapes. So you have say a triangle, you, you need to build something or a shape like this three and it will do using this kind of computer aided design software and the 3D object scanner. As its name implies, additive manufacturing adds materials to create an object. By contrast, when you create an object by traditional means, like I was talking about the production system in a company, it is often necessary to remove material uh, through machine, uh, machining, carving, shaping and other means. It does not need this. Although the terms 3D printing for or rapid prototyping are casually used to discuss additive manufacturing, each process is actually a subset of additive manufacturing. So, as I said, mostly it is 3D printing, but rapid prototyping is also a term which is a little bit different from 3D printing. So, why additive manufacturing seems new to many, because it is, it is around for several decades, but the right applications came in the system in last say 10 to 15 years. Complex geometries, simplified fabrication, all these things uh, are, uh, are associated with this. As a result, many opportunities are there, many patents have come in the last 10 years, 15 years on this area, how you can do this kind of 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So the advantages, what are the advantages of this? So we spoke cost effective creation of complex geometries. That, so you used to have different kinds of machineries for different types of geometries. Suppose one particular kind of machine can only produce <coughs> suppose a circle of, of alumi aluminum materials. Another just to produce a say rectangular box. You used to have different different machineries for producing all these things. Now with the help of these 3D printers, you can, with the help of one machine, you can produce any kind of geometry and if you, if you can draw with your computer edit software <coughs> CAD, you can use your CAD software and you can draw a complex geometry, it will give you the automatical 3D shape with the help of that 3D printer. So this is how cost and effectivity is that you do not need to have all those high uh, costed machineries to produce a complex geometric architecture. So for startups especially it is very very affordable because they have limited budget. 
so they can use this kind of 3D printers to start with. Of course, it has limitations. It cannot replace all the existing machineries, but at least to some extent, 40 to 50 percent of the machineries can, uh, or, or the, the activities they can do, can be replaced by a 3D printer. So, startup who do not need multiple things or the full infrastructure ready, they can start with this 3D printers. And it is completely customizable. So that is another advantage which small companies can take. Because the process is based on <coughs> these CAD designs, any product alteration can be done in this kind of 3D printers. And it is definitely ideal for rapid prototyping. As I said, it can produce within no time and allow us for the creation of parts with specific properties. So you need some specific properties, specific portion of the uh, whole design, you can do that using this 3D printers or additive manufacturing. So this is the first pillar of industry 4.0. Second is augmented reality. So you can, those who are very kind of, uh, they are uh, into gaming, gaming into say FIFA and all those uh, gaming softwares, uh, playstations, they are already aware about this VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality. So augmented reality is the integration of the digital information with the user's environment in real time. What is the difference with virtual reality? Virtual, virtual reality creates a totally artificial environment. Whereas augmented reality is suppose, this, if you see this picture in the right hand side, you are you have born into Amazon perhaps and you want to see, there is a picture of a sofa set, you want to see how it will look like in your uh, say uh, drawing room. So, you can use this kind of AR tools just to see how it is looking like into your room. <coughs> so this is augmented reality which is mixing physical world with the virtual world. So this, this has again many advantages. It delivers visual elements, sounds and other sensory information. So one of the major, so I am also working in some of the patents uh, where we are trying to give this kind of senses. We have different sense uh, organs. So how to recreate those kinds of senses into our <coughs> augmented reality, into a virtual reality. Suppose how you can bring the sense of taste, the sense of aroma. Suppose you want to have the same aroma you will have from a biryani, say from a uh, Dada Bodhi uh, shop. So, you need, want to create the same kind of aroma. So, this with different kinds of techniques like uh, I have a patent on uh, there is a thing called uh, e-nose, electronic nose which actually tries to uh, bring the different chemicals and there is an, another thing called all factometer. So, anything, so this terminology you should know, as this is an FTP session, I will tell you the So, uh, there is a thing called olfactometer and olfactory signature. What is olfactory signature? The spelling is O-L-F-A-C-T-O-R-Y, olfactory signature. Like you have a handwritten signature, you can have a olfactory signature for any living beings and even for non-living beings through their chemical substances. Even for a human, you have an olfactory signature. Because you secrete hormone, you have a smell, so from there you can build an olfactory signature, which is a combination, which will be a mathematical equation. Right? Square, which is, you have certain percentage of X1 chemical, certain percentage of X2 chemical. A combination would be different from the person sitting, sitting beside you. So, through this kind of things, you can create an olfactory signature of their particular food, of the Dada Bodhi Biryani. 
So you can give this digital uh, thing to that part particular person, and there is another option that that will change that digital signature into a physical one. So if you can change that, that person would be able to have the same aroma he would have got visiting the shop. So these are the things which are being brought into the AR world. This is still under process. You will not find many of the things, but there you will find slowly one or two things are coming up, <coughs> especially with this kind of uh, e retailers like Amazon. So, the, or there will be future restaurants. There are restaurants in uh, <coughs> Europe, there are restaurants in America who have already brought this kind of things that they will give this kind of aroma sense to the person. So this is where the augmented reality is extremely important. I am talking about the food industry. Even for any food supply chain, suppose uh, you have you want to know whether these bananas are available, which is coming from say say a particular location of West Bengal or a particular any other food items which would be used in the other supply chain. So for that, whether they are fresh or not. The freshness can also be measured in the augmented reality. So this is how uh, augmented reality is becoming much more important. Just although it started from gaming, although it started from gaming and some fun, fun loving things, it has many serious components. That is why I try to give this example that how it is important in the industry. Not only food industry, you can think about many things like in identifying criminals. Now it is done through CCTV or say dogs. Why dogs are preferred? Because they have extremely high uh, this aroma sensations. But if you can create a digital replica of this, dogs would not be required. Do not need to train the uh, dogs and depend on them. Humans themselves can do with the help of this kind of a tool, which is a combination of uh, this kind of senses, which can measure this kind of senses. That okay, instead of on, not only having a CCTV installed in traffic signals, can also have a electronic nose also <coughs> set up in different junctions. So you know this person has gone because sometimes the person might be in disguise, right? He has. Uh, committed a crime and he is in disguise. So CCTV would not be able to identify that person. But this e nose would identify his olfactory signature and the CBIs and the EDs and the different CIDs would be using this to identify this criminal. So this is why augmented reality is very very important in today's world. So this is just a difference between augmented reality and virtual reality can go through. By that time, I'll take a seat. Any, any 
any other other question? Regarding this additive uh, manufacturing, mm -hmm. generally I think the problem pin now we are facing that the basic metal is falling. Uh, some metal part, that is, some we have those in our lab, but uh, those are falling. Uh, I don't know in Europe or America they are using metal, but they are basically falling. But it is nice. I mean, microstructure we are making microstructure is nice. I could not believe that past that that, that kind of precision can be made. Right. No, basically, <coughs> it is the concept came concept came uh, not uh, many years ago. So it is still, as I said, all these nine components or nine pillars are extremely important, and it is going to evolve much. <coughs> as you said about polymers, it is also trying to use different kinds of metal already but with limited success, I would say. So, people are working in all these different nine pillars. So, for a, talking about PhDs, people who are doing this PhDs can think about <coughs> the nine and the three, the, those twelve pillars, and can have that PhD on that particular area if you haven't already finalized. Because these are also internally linked with industry. As I was talking about, Everything is linked. It is also linked with your, with your NEP, okay. uh, the National Education Policy, because there what you need to have, if you need to have better civil score, you need to have a better industry coverage. So where you can get industry coverage much more, if it is linked with your the industrial concepts, like industry 4.0, all these nine pillars. If you think about an area which is related to any of these areas, then industry could also be interested. Not only the educationalists, but the industrialists could also be interested. So think from that perspective as well. One thing I can add here, yeah. that the evolution of what I can see, that uh, I am also working in electronic skin. Okay. So sometimes electronics, not most, electronic skin and data. So when we published work in 2018 or 19, then uh, just we uh, made the device to make the electronic scheme and put the data. Nowadays, it is not sufficient. We have to add Arduino devices and put the, uh, we have to show that, that we can uh, put the data in cloud and after that we can see it, uh, through any computer or any mobile. And, uh, and what I am seeing in 2024, right now, we have to add some other AI or like that, uh, so that what you will do with this data, okay, you are uh, putting your skin uh, to any human or any sensor to human or any IoT devices to human body, but what you will do to those data? So can you, uh, can you uh, early detect any arthritis, uh, early detect any, uh, what you say, autism or, or other things? So now that, that part is coming, and it's coming very fast. I mean, if we put, uh, I mean, all of us, many of us, I think, working on that field, but I am seeing that uh, it is coming so fast that, uh, I mean, I cannot uh, neglect that thing that, okay, I have to learn those AI things. I mean, I am that, my account is physics, material science, physics. So, uh, now I have to learn those things because they are asking, uh, can you put uh, the data analysis here? Can you predict, uh, uh, can you take 100 patient data and predict who is suffering from arthritis or not? So not only device, but now they are asking the yeah. Because, because, as I said, uh, this digital information you are saving. For example, I talked about that elevation thing. So the elevators saving those data are not only saving them, they are also having many predictive models which will give you whether this is called predictive maintenance okay you know that this particular elevator is going to better so you have a, a machine learning model developed just to predict that okay which one needs immediate attention so you do not wait the sensor to show that okay it has all crossed the threshold but you are trying to predict that Elevator number 14 is going to break. Similarly, some operations where you 
cannot, so I'm talking about you gave example the healthcare industry. You want to operate a person, there is the physical doctor is not available. And you need absolute precision, which sometimes even the doctors fail to do. So in future you will see much more usage of those kind of robots and other yes, kind of yes. devices. And if they will do that operation absolutely precisely so that there is no chance of accident. So you know that the concept of Six Sigma, the, uh, the healthcare industry work in say 12 Sigma, 24 Sigma mode. The healthcare, the airline industry where you need much more precision because you are working with human lives. So you definitely need to have this kind of things where your data is there, you have this digital twin technology, along with that you bring those precision and all and robotics into it so that it becomes so everything is kind of interlinked. you cannot forget one, one to the other. So that is why knowledge of core is important, knowledge of one particular thing is very much important, you have to be expert in one area. But you need to be adaptive to know all the new technologies are coming, at least basic to intermediate of that particular area, that particular topic. So that is why I, this particular uh, <coughs> agenda is very important, or this particular subject is very important of knowing the industry 4.0 and 5.0 concepts. And but how they have evolved. So that is why I thought that I would start with this and definitely this uh, subsequent session I will talk about the uh, national education policy which I think uh, our chief case covered already a little bit. So there will be some repetitions as well. Now <coughs> going to the third pillar of uh, the industry 4.0 which is autonomous robots. We talk about the robots which uh, I think uh, we talked about the robots in 1970s. Uh, I think we used to have in our childhood days one uh, serial which used to come in national television called Johnny Soko and Flying Robot. Okay, so which used to uh, fight with one of the uh, Pilemius uh, animal and it was showing only some few features the robot can have but could robot think, could robot decide something themselves, those kind of things were not there. But if you see today's some of the web series and movies, you will see uh, that they are showing future of 2030, 2050 they are showing that you have a replica of a person uh, who is thinking like you, who can decide something. So why these are important? Of course, it has negative things <coughs> associated with it because uh, your privacy, your identity can be negotiated. But what are the advantages? First, we should, we, sh we should judge everything from both sides of the coins. What are the positive things? What are the negative things? And why we should have thought about that particular idea or invention? Like this autonomous robot. Definitely, we we'll talk about the negative things, but what are the things, why it has come out? So true autonomous robots are intelligent machines that can perform tasks and operate in an environment independent, without human control and intervention. This level of autonomy gives the workforce the ability to delegate dull, dangerous, or dirty tasks to the robots so humans can spend more time doing the invest, interesting, engaging, and valuable part of their job. This is how it came up. So, for example, you are talking about not only robots, think about autonomous cars. Every car is now coming up with some autonomous features. Like even the mid-level cars, like cars between 20 to 30 lakhs, have this kind of features of they will automatically 
put the car in the parking without you use the steering wheel. So this is a level of the autonomy two or in between autonomous vehicle two to three. So there are zero to five levels for autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicle zero meaning there is no autonomy and autonomous <coughs> five meaning it, it can without there is no steering wheel in the car. It is just like a sofa. You are sitting and giving uh, uh, instruction uh, to the car that I want to go from point A to point B, from say from Manipur to say Howrah. I want to go. Uh, you take this GPS route. You select that GPS route, and it will automatically take this. And then you do not have any hassle of using brakes, accelerators, whether uh, a cow is passing the road, nothing. Everything would be taken care by the car. That is level 5.0. Tesla. Tesla has already reached level 3.0. It is uh, training on 4.0. 4.0 is what? 4.0 is it is also autonomous, but it can work within a certain region. Suppose within a stadium, it can work, but it cannot work in any roads. Suppose it can work with only in one particular city of US, but it cannot be uh, brought into India and do that. So uh, autonomous 5.0 reaching there is difficult, but Tesla is targeting say mid of 2030s or even before that they want to achieve uh, autonomous car 5.0. Similarly, these robots are also going into that direction that how automatically they can do any, anything without any intervention. So there are companies who are developing autonomous robots which can perform. Like automated guided vehicles, I guess. <coughs> the drones. Now in different countries, drones are doing these parcel deliveries. So you do not need any human agent to just deliver your products to different homes. It is done by <coughs> drone takes a decision, okay, which particular, I have the address, I have the GPS location, I have to fly, this is a uh, an area uh, <coughs> which I cannot pass, restricted area, suppose Raj Bhavan, you cannot pass a drone over, over that. So it takes all those things and goes to the right route to reach the destination. It delivers, it identifies this is the person whom I should deliver with some biometric features and all. It delivers and come back. So this it is one type of autonomous robot basically that is performing the activity without any help. And it will also come, there are inventions uh, in this area like people are thinking about a disaster recovery situation. For example, you are stuck in a flood in a village and you have very, say, high, uh, highly precious metals like you have diamonds, you have golds. But if the flood is going to hit your village, say, it is, say your uh, house is already submerged, you want to, you, uh, you are pro still protecting the, uh, these high value metals but after one or two days, the flood is going to fully capture everything. So how you want to save that? The BSF and the other uh, Javans are going to save you, but they are not going to save your precious metals and everything. So there would be services very near in India itself that which will, uh, you can contact. It will pick up your uh, its belongings keep in a safe place like a bank or something so that whenever you are kind of it is already in safe place you are stuck still in the flood uh, region uh, the belongings would be saved in a uh, safe place and once you are free you are kind of evacuated from that particular place you can claim by certain kind of say again again some biometrics and other so this kind of thing, so everything is coming, thinking about what is the problem and how we can address. 
problem is uh, disaster situation how i can save my freedom the problem is that i want to reduce the burden on the human resources to uh, send parcels how i can do that i do not have doctor in a remote place who will operate from all these questions this kind of ideas are coming in and all these concepts are shaping up so that is why autonomous robots so it's absolutely it's a huge usage of artificial intelligence here in in case of building <coughs> autonomous robots without ai technologies you cannot build autonomous robots so some industries that utilize autonomous robots autonomous robots for warehousing so autonomous so i i have given the example of the healthcare one this picture you can see is a person a person is it um, the bed and the autonomous robot is like a doctor visiting this patient so autonomous <coughs> mobile robots for transporting materials etc to uh, they can be used for sanitation <coughs> disinfection uh, efficiently clean healthcare facilities from this kind of small small activities they are now going into even operating patients for that you need to bring some laws as well everything every this kind of technology which are coming has to have some legal implications also for example that autonomous car if he if a uh, uh, person who is walking on the road what who should be blamed for that is it the autonomous car company is it the owner who should be blamed so all these things are associated uh, you can watch a movie called a web series called guilty minds in amazon which is every episode is on this kind of new features artificial intelligence or this kind of other industry 4.0 or 5.0 are coming up with and what are the legal implications of that and how in future we can bring this together so that is what if you are doing your research in engineering and um, science and you do not know anything about the law no you need to know every part of it so again i might be repeated it you need to know those kind of things as well you are doing some research and do not know what would be the impact in india if you publish that kind of an idea you publish a report publish an uh, article on that and what would be the effect from the government and government agencies whether it is what is what are the legal implications you are talking about cloning you are talking about many other things you need to know the implications of that to the real world so this this is on the autonomous scale now what is big data and analytics so until when the session is i might not be completing the full slides by then so i will be continuing a little bit of this uh, in the second session complete it and then <coughs> go 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 to the end now big data analytics we have heard this word so many times at least this now become a little old but at least say start with say 2010 to 2016 2017 this is the term which used which was used extensively so what is big data analytics before big data people used to have used to save data in a location like a database in, in to have a database a relational database where you have schema where you have say a primary key and foreign key in different tables and you save the data in a database then from there you used to get those data analyze those data again save them in a database so which used to take a huge time because fast you need to think about what kind of schema schema i need to use how i can save the data there is a concept called etl extraction transformation and loading of data first you extract the data 
they transform into say different fields like numeric text etc you give them a data type you give save a particular location that it can only hold up to 25 characters if it can hold up to say this many numerics all those are bounded it could not you would not save the data you wanted to have at a fast space so that is why this big data concept came up and which uses this distributed technology or distributed system what it does did not have this etl process in a big data you have this kind of a process you collect you process you scrub you analyze so what what you do what is the difference with any normal etl process that you collect the data which comes structured semi structured unstructured and collected from multiple sources across web mobile cloud it is then stored in a repository a data lake data warehouse anything you can save in any form it need not be structured like as i said the schemas and tables and the primary key and the foreign key it can be saved in any structured semi structured unstructured form. unstructured form suppose some web scrap data you have scrap a particular code on the website and you have some textual information from does not have any primary key anything it does not have any schema okay so you collect the data then you process during the processing phase the stored data is verified sorted filtered so you want to do some verification sorting filtering this kind of process is also there but it need not be of any bounded state that you have to perform <coughs> can skip any of this step can collect and directly <coughs> analyze so process or scrap are to intermediate steps which are not mandatory like the extraction <coughs> uh, like the etl process where you need to have extraction then transformation then do scrubbing scrubbing is basically the duplication you have lot many duplicates lot many missing missing information so how to deduplicate how to impute the missing values all these things are done in the scrubbing so the as i said again are not a mandatory step and then you analyze the data then you create different models machine learning models uh, to analyze the data so which is much faster than the etl process now this is not a very defined defined uh, technology this big data now you will not hear big data that much because many uh, say cloud platforms are already giving this kind of a infrastructure where we can prepare the data within no time and do the analysis with within no time and we do not need to follow the etl and they not they are not calling it as a specifically big data concept because big data has some typical concepts which these cloud platforms are not exactly following so that is not defined big data process but they are actually having the similar processes or steps like big data so that is why this is one of the concept which has become a little older concept and used a uh, much less than the other pillars we are talking about <coughs> so some of the say technologies of big data you have hard hadoop you have hard no sql database no sql database data lakes and warehouses <coughs> so there you will you, the hard uh, would have hard uh, no sql database like Uh, cloud end uh, then you have to have hard uh, databases like uh, what is dynamo db so dynamo db you will find in aws uh, cloud end you will uh, uh, you will find it in various other red hat and other uh, cloud platforms so basically as i said it does not follow 
a SQL that you need to write a SQL program to uh, get that data, extract that data. The select start from that dash and dash tables, and you have a group by function, and you have all those SQL commands that you need. You do not need to do that. You just save it without any schema, without any primary key. So you can just like a storage, you use that. So that is why the concept of NoSQL database came from Big Data and Analytics. Hadoop. Hadoop is one of the very first frameworks of collection uh, and storage of Big Data. Uh, Apache Hadoop is one of the open source ecosystem. So you will find many, you used to have many Hadoop programmers or Hadoop uh, analyst earlier, say even five to six years back in the industry. As I said, it's rapidly evolving, so you have, Hadoop has also lost a little bit of uh, importance. More people who are aware about the how you can save data in AWS, in Azure, in Google Cloud Platform are much more preferred than these Hadoop engineers or uh, this kind of people. But this concept of NoSQL database and this distributed technologies are important. And you will have here data lakes. Again, your AWS have options of different data lakes. Your Azure have data lakes. Again, here you do not need to keep the data in structured format. Like lake, you have many fishes and many various other uh, marine lives. Similarly, data lakes, you have data in various formats. If one one uh, particular storage has text data, again you have another file which is numeric, another file which is say just uh, some uh, scraps from web pages, all those things are residing in the same place. Whereas in the traditional world, we used to have schema and it is only saving suppose numeric data, it does not have any unstructured data, all those things used to be there, but right now it is all data lakes and warehouses, which can keep any types of data. So this is collection and storage. Similarly, processing, I talked about uh, <coughs> processing and storing. <coughs> I told you that this is basically deduplication. Basically, just like how you can uh, clean your clothes, it cleans your data. It uh, removes duplicates, it removes missing values, or it can impute with some average values. All those things or replace with average value. All those things are done in this graphing. And processing is basically some data integration, uh, in-memory data processing, so that the processing happens first, and uh, it uses your uh, mem uh, memory, the uh, RAM, and uh, all those things can happen very fast. So this is the processing and scrubbing, and then this analysis. So this this is uh, on this consists of your data mining, predictive analytics, and real time analytics. Since I come from that background, I'll talk a little bit on this, and I can. We have some time. So this is this concept is called CRISP DM. C R I S P <coughs> dash D M. Cross industry standard process for data data mining. So the first concept is the data mining. So what is this CRISPR concept? Basically, whenever you are doing any data mining or any modeling type of job, you need to first have this all this all this is a little I'll I'll talk about each each and every step. First one is business understanding. So whenever you are doing a data mining or analytics job, you need to have the business problem at hand. Suppose you want to do the data mining or the predictive modeling on uh, you want to predict which are the people who are going to default in your credit card payment. You want to predict that. Or say suppose 
uh, ART wants to know in the next three months who are the people who are going to shift from ART to Jio. So this is your business problem. It's always start with a business problem. So to do or to resolve a business problem, you need to have a business understanding of that particular problem and associated. So you need to know if you are have to, if I have to predict who are going to default in my credit or who are going to shift from my service provider to the other service provider like a geo. I need to know about the concept of the telecom industry. What are the data that I need to solve that problem? What are the things I should know about the credit card industry to solve that problem? So you need to have business understanding. Then followed by your data understanding. So as I said, to solve this problem, what are the data? What are the fields I should have? So if I know that, I need to have a very good data understanding. Okay, that this should have at least minimum of 15,000 rows for last six months data with such and such features like it should have for example for the Airtel Geo one is called the customer churn <coughs> analytics C H U R N customer churn analytics or customer churn analytics I need to know what is the usage of different phone uh, things like whether how many calls <coughs> I generally do what is what is the number of average calls per day how many uh, so what is the usage of internet, What which plan I am currently into, all those things I should know. So I need to know what kind of data I need, I need to know how the data understanding and it goes hand in hand with your business understanding. That is why there is a two way line, business understanding to data understanding, data understanding to business understanding because these are closely related. Then you need to have this data preparation, like we were showing, that you need to have some scrubbing, you need to create something so that the data can be used for analysis, used for modeling. So that is why you first need to have a data preparation and then you have to have this modeling step, this using some machine learning model models or statistical model or AI models built on top of that. And again, this is a two-way process with data preparation. It cannot happen that very first time whatever data you have processed, that is ready for your modeling. When, while doing the modeling, you find that the data is still not that good. I need to <coughs> remove this kind of duplicates. I need to uh, have many features. There are four or five features I am missing. So you have to go back to the data preparation step again. Again, you redo your modeling and then you, after four times such kind of iterations or more than that, you finally are, you have, you are finally happy with the, your modeling results. And whatever results come up, you have to have the power to evaluate that. That means you not only need to have how to do that, how to do that first, but you need to have the required skills. If you do not know what is the meaning of R square in a regression, what is the meaning of say uh, an ANOVA table in a regression, suppose I am talking about say only giving an example for regression, you do not know how to build the regression equation from unstandardized coefficient table, how to remove your independent variables using t test significant value or t values. <coughs> so no use, you have created some result, but you do not know how to evaluate them. Then you need to have this kind of evaluation system and finally you need to have a deployment system that you have built a model, but there needs to be a something which is where you can deploy the model. For example, when you apply for a loan, the managers, the SBI, suppose you have applied a loan to the SBI. SBI manager says it will take some time, it will need 15 days to approve your uh, loan. Why? First, they take all the information, sanitize it, whether the information is correct, they validate it. 
then it passes through the scoring this is called a score card this is called a score card from sbi or any other bank you uh, find they have their own score card they will pass through all of the values like what is your age what is your income what is your previous credit history all those goes through the this particular score card and it will show up a score so suppose 750 and 750 is above the cutoff suppose their cutoff is 720 that means you are eligible for it. so you need to have a deployment system to use your model if, suppose you have created a model which gives code like 0.6674 the uh, layman's will not understand what is 0.6674 so you have to tell them you convert that 0.6674 within a range say suppose it should be between 200 to 800 so and i have a cutoff of 720 if it is more than 720 it is automatically approved Whenever I apply for a home loan, it should be approved because my score is more than 720. So they have a scoring mechanism. So they have deployed, they have deployed the machine learning model to a SBI system, which is a computer application, wherever the say branch manager or this RSC PC, the SBI RSC PC resource, keep those details. It will automatically give you this code. That is the deployment. That you have deployed in a tool which can be used by the layman's and not by statistical analysts or not by engineer. But any layman can use that. So that is called a deployment. So suppose it has been deployed in a SPI cloud environment uh, and there you have this tool. This application fetches information from the backend. In backend, you have different databases where these modeling scores are getting saved and it is converted into a real, realistic score between 200 to 800. So you need to have all this deployment system. As this is a cyclic process, it goes, you have, sometimes you have, suppose IBM has developed something for SPI, SPI, people will say, no, no, this is not serving our purpose, we need such and such features at that. So this way, it will continue uh, and it will evolve and you will have a mental process to maintain that. So this is how the analytics cycle or the data mining cycle will go on. So you need to have the cloud connectivity. Why cloud connectivity is important? The fifth pillar uh, is because it used to be that you had to you, you have your own server and data was support, uh, was saved in that particular server. Now we need to needed to have physical server, which had huge cost to maintain and everything. And suppose some this kind of disaster happens and you lose all your data. All those problems were there until the invention of this cloud connectivity. So this is called on premise. Whenever you have data in your own server, it is called on-premise or in short on-prem. But instead of that, what what was the concept came up? The cloud concept like public cloud, private <coughs> cloud, and hybrid cloud. This kind of three concept came up <coughs> after the invention of this, this cloud connectivity and cloud computing. So what is the difference with on-prem and public, private and hybrid network. So I'll go the lines, but before that, uh, very easily how it can be defined. Basically, <coughs> on-prem, as I said, your own server, you are maintaining everything. So no third party is involved. Public cloud, you are using, say, Azure at AWS or any other services in a public environment where your data is not restricted or uh, saved privately. So you are using some, uh, some of the features <coughs> that you or AWS is, uh, or these are these are different cloud platforms are given and you are using public. But if you want to restrict for your own private network, if you 
where you have own, your own login, your company's login. I'm not talking about individual login. Your company's login and password and everything. And everything is flowing with, within your organization, not going beyond. What is the difference? This is called private cloud. But what is the difference with on-prem? On-prem, you are maintaining everything. On-prem, it is your server. On private cloud, the servers are not yours. It is not maintained by your company. It is maintained by suppose <coughs> Azure or AWS or any other cloud provider. They are having their servers, but it is they are maintaining it privately. No one else other than your organization can access it. So that is called a private cloud. And hybrid cloud is basically a combination of public and private, where you have some components which are open to all but some components which are quite private. So that is a hybrid cloud. Most of the other organizations are following a hybrid cloud approach because they do not need everything to be maintained privately. <coughs> so for those uh, features or those systems which needs to be maintained privately, they have private network or private cloud. And the, for, for the other ones, they are maintaining public cloud. So, that is why most of the companies fall under this hybrid cloud components. So, that is why this cloud connectivity becomes very useful because these companies have data centers across the world. And it is saving you from very many, many disasters. Like Google has set up a data center under the earth in US. So, if you have a fire situation, if you have a flood situation, if you have something else, this particular data center is saving your data because it is underneath your uh, surface, art surface. And it is using geothermal, so I was talking about the sustainability, which I will again touch upon in uh, pillars of uh, industry 5.0. So they are using magma heat, they are using art's own heat and all those things to create energy and they are running the data centers using those energies rather than using fossil fuels. So not only they are saving it from many natural disasters, but it is also using green energy or geothermal energy instead of the uh, regular energy. <coughs> options like petrol, diesel. So, this is why uh, that is major advantage. Second is, it is not a absolutely pocket friendly. <coughs> Only when you can have pay as you use this kind of an option. So, as many times uh, call the cloud services, only they need to pay the charge. Instead of, if you are maintaining your own server, that means it is a continuous cost on your phone. So these are the smoothly features or help you get with cloud connectivity. Now these are the four terminologies. I'll pause for a few seconds on this slide. <coughs> read on the road. Who are 
subscribing to agro services the then chart so the cost of cyber security center are very high so cyber attacks are also increasingly sophisticated so as i said there are multiple uh, ways we are also trying to prevent for example uh, we used to create a link in our mobile and uh, this uh, cyber criminals used to say that this click on this link if you are facing this problem and uh, we will solve your problem so that is to be a link through which they can capture your phone or your uh, uh, laptop or desktop whatever you are using it's a screen sharing option option basically so they can see whatever password you are writing whatever things you are writing on screen and they can capture it. now the banks have come, come up with a counter strategy that if you are in a screen sharing mode the banking application won't open so now if you want to open online sbi it won't allow if you are on a screen sharing mode so this is how although there are many cyber attackers there are cyber security measures as well so it is a critical broad level issue because if this issue occurs it is the impact is so huge so it's a broad level discussion a uh, cyber crime has happened uh, of a large scale then the, all the board members of the company then uh, decide for a meeting and they discuss this is so much important and it's a very big business companies are formed just to do cyber crime there are companies of hackers so you can understand that uh, how big the business is and you all know about the cyber threats of malware backdoors phone jacking crypto jacking ddos dns i try to define this uh, cyber threats you can, you can read it through critical infrastructure components which are more vulnerable to any kind of cyber attacks we have to identify those critical infrastructure activities or <coughs> critical infrastructure units so those are the things the attacker should first target right for example in a financial organization they will try to hack your <coughs> user id and password so your user level authentication is the most critical infrastructure that you need to build that is why this otp based structure came up because people used to uh, get this kind of access to your system and from your history of usage they used to get this login credentials now they cannot do that so and <coughs> cyber crimes on the financial organization are much less because of this thing that you have two types of authentication three types of authentication you you whenever you log in it asks for your one time password and that way it saves you uh, credentials from that so this is basically a critical infrastructure that first of all you need to save the uh, hacking part of it of your credentials how do you log in to this system? so then your network security you have different types of firewalls and other things so that any attacker cannot directly come into your system the firewalls will prevent and will ask you that this such and such application is tried to reach your network shall we allow this kind of 
fire of walls or gatekeepers systems are there. Then you have cloud security. So as I said, the Azure cloud example. Every cloud platforms are giving you separate security so that <coughs> the cloud systems are not hacked or attacked. IoT security, I talked about the sensors. Now for this digital twin and this kind of sensor information, even the school buses are using IoT devices just to track where exactly the school bus is. The parents are given uh, this access that okay. Now if that is compromised, then the security of the children would also be compromised. So you need to see how you can secure this sensor so that it cannot be kind of, um, uh, it is not hacked by any hacker. So that is why the sensor information, so even for healthcare, so you can <coughs> kill a person if you are talking about, you take a, suppose you have hacked uh, the device through which uh, a medicine is given or something like that in, in a hospital, then uh, that person's uh, life is at threat. So that is why IoT security is very important. And of course there are application level security. Every software application has some security measures associated with it so that the application is not um, under threat. So these are the five types of cybersecurity. I think I can close for now. I will start in the <coughs> work on self-powered pacemaker. So then I found it is programmable, reprogrammable and a person outside from outside her body, he or she can program our uh, <coughs> this, uh, Hi. Hi. And uh, always I comes to I tell students whenever I meet with these students that the uh, pulse that is 5 volt pulse and I give you 50 volt pulse for 2 seconds will done. That, that kind of manipulation we can do. <coughs> so, uh, it's the end of this session, I think. Not the, that is the full end of this session. So, if we have partial end, if you have any question and ask, no, at first they have any question, then I have to beat that because the uh, next session will be chaired or moderated by other person. So, if you have any question, please ask. So, we have a very good resource person with us and uh, is really, really. I, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm really enriched with this uh, this topic and his lecture. So, anyone, please ask any question you have, or you can think about the questions also. I have this huh. So, uh, <coughs> what I have to do? I have to read that session, and uh, just I just when I was uh, listening his lecture. I was astonished and, and really thrilled. And uh, when I started uh, work on uh, this uh, sensor and uh, renewable energy source that I worked in 2015, <coughs> just to fabricate material and device and we report that uh, yes, we make sensors and we make uh, renewable energy <coughs> devices. Okay. So uh, that's all. But suddenly in 2018, we found that all the world, what they are telling that these devices can be used in healthcare monitoring, these devices can be used in uh, IMT, that is implantable medical devices, that can be used in robotics. So we started. So we are the third or fourth graded researcher, I think, in, in, uh, in terms of that thing. But uh, uh, then what we do, we apply our devices, test sensor, those uh, devices, 
and of course that's generated energy generated devices in uh, say distribution of uh, finger bending we can use to monitor the different uh, bending of a finger so that that was easily published in 2018 to 2023 we have published almost 25 article in reputed journals all around 10 19 <coughs> Suddenly we found this, I was telling, suddenly they are asking us, okay, you are giving data of, you are predict, you are saying that the devices can be used for such as things. Why are you not analyzing this thing? Why are you are not giving even the biocompatibility testing? Can we really that can be used to human body? So we have to put those things. Nowadays what, are, so we get generally voltage signals. So we have to do FFT and all those analytics parts and all that said, yes, that can be distinguished for different persons. So the technology that, that he was telling that, that the industry 3 to 4, that is a quick jump. And I think 4 to 5, that is a more quicker uh, jump. So all we need to uh, just accept those changes. And uh, nowadays I am taking help, Shine was there. So I was taking help um, of uh, computer science engineers, of uh, uh, bioengineers and doctors because we work on also implantable medical devices. Not in, in that that is not possible in our full lab or in the other full lab. So we are taking help of <coughs> different doctors. So so we have to I mean ready. So something is coming very good. So thank you, thank you very much. And thank you all of you again for coming here. And thank you, uh, PICP Atul, and our, <coughs> our colleagues.